The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Welcome to another edition of What Catholics Believe. I'm Father William Jenkins, the priest in charge at Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio, a traditional Catholic church where only the traditional Latin Mass of the Roman Rite is offered. And uh, at our school, only the traditional Catholic faith is taught. Now, I'm going to depart from uh, past formats in order to begin a series of programs on the Catechism. Uh, these will not be theological treatments because I am not uh, a theologian, uh, as others claim to be these days, but only a, uh, a simple catechist. And as such, I would like to begin a series of catechetical instructions in the Catholic faith using as a, uh, a textbook the uh, what is called a brief catechism for adults a complete handbook on how to be a good catholic by father william j cogan and i'm going to read a bit of an introduction to this particular book and in, in uh, using this text I, I want to make it clear that i do not consider it to be a perfect catechism. There are many better catechisms, more complete catechisms of the Catholic faith. The ideal text to use would be the Roman Catechism or the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which first appeared uh, actually under the authority of Pope St. Pius, uh, Pope St. Pius V in the year 1566. That was the first edition of the Catechism of the Council of Trent. That is very thorough and would be the best catechism to read. There's another excellent catechism in English, uh, which is that uh, called My Catholic Faith by Bishop Morrow, M-O-R-R-O-W. That also is very thorough. But this catechism by Father Cogan uh, has the, the benefit of being brief. Uh, it is brief because it is written for busy adults, who want to know more about the fundamentals of their faith, or a refresher in the fundamentals of their faith, or for converts. And it was actually, uh, I believe, originally compiled for the sake of converts. Now, the, uh, the book begins in its title page, oh, by the way, I, I should mention this, that this book was published by 10 books and publishers. Uh, it was published by Tan in 1993, but it was previously copyrighted by Father William J. Cogan uh, in 1958, and the original edition was copyrighted in 1951 by Reverend William J. Cogan and published in November of 1951. Uh, now, I don't know if Tan books... Uh, actually is still functioning as Tan Books and still makes this uh, catechism available, but uh, it has uh, a, lot of, a lot of good things about it. In 1993, when Tan republished it, it included uh, modernist, modern changes, uh, particularly in the laws of fasting, but it maintained also uh, statements of the traditional uh, rule, rules of the Church. And so, in that regard, it's useful, and uh, in some cases, it actually is useful in comparing the traditional practice with the with the modernist practice. Uh, I thought I would also read for you from the title page uh, the reference to the sacred scripture book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter six, verses eighteen to twenty, that is quoted there. Quote: "From thy youth up, receive instruction." And even to thy gray hairs thou shalt find wisdom. Come to her as one that ploweth and soweth, and wait for her good fruits. For in working about her thou shalt labor a little, 
and yet, and shalt quickly eat of her fruits. Close quote. That is uh, taken from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiasticus. It is obviously used to point out that if we do study our faith, we will labor a little, but we'll reap great rewards from it. Now, uh, also, in the uh, beginning of the book, we have a quotation from the very beginning of St. Paul's Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 1. Uh, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, last of all in these days, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Again, that is from St. Paul's Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1. Now there is a publisher's note from Tan Books uh, included here, but I thought it not a bad idea, actually, to quote from the author's preface, that is, from Father Kogan's uh, work of 1958, and it gives you a little bit of uh, understanding of the the providence of this this book and its series of chapters and questions and answers. This is from, as I say, Father Kogan's own author's preface of 1958. This book is the work of many priests who actually instruct prospective converts from all walks of life. The original mimeographed edition was based on the series of instructions given by priests engaged in convert work for many years in the Archdiocese of Chicago. After being used experimentally for several inquiry classes, it was revised according to the suggestions of these priests. Since its first edition in 1951, it has become practically the standard catechism for instructing non-Catholics, not only in the United States and Canada, but wherever English is spoken. Priests from all over the world have sent their suggestions and comments for making the catechism even better. The author appreciates their help and hopes that they and the other priests who use this book will continue with their suggestions. And then there is a paragraph wherein Father Coggan uh, makes special notes of uh, priests who have helped with the compiling of this catechism. And uh, after that, he goes on to say, This edition, while following the time-tried traditional approach to the Catholic religion, has incorporated what is good in newer techniques, the more abundant use of Holy Scripture, the practical points at the end of each lesson, and the shorter answers will be welcomed by the priests who use this catechism. This book aims at three things. First, clearness in teaching religion so that the prospective convert can clearly know what he is supposed to believe and do in order to save his soul. The book is not meant to be a theological manual, but rather a handbook in which non-Catholics can find the main ideas given in the instructions. Second, ordinary language. The book has been written in the language spoken by people today. The use of theological terms and anglicized Latin words has been avoided as much as possible. Actual experience in giving the final examination to thousands of non-Catholics has helped the author to express theological concepts in the familiar words of everyday conversation. Third, correct emphasis on the things necessary to form a good Christian conscience. The book is designed to prepare its users for conversion, not to make theologians of them. Hence, the author has tried to give the proper emphasis to sin, heaven, hell, prayer, the necessity of grace, and the sacraments. The special treatment of marriage and family life is based on the conviction that most people will save their souls or lose them as married people, and that therefore they should clearly know their duties as married people and as parents. It is hoped that this book will help priests in leading to the Master, those who until now have had only a few crumbs that fell from his table. Reverend William J. Cogan, 1958. And the introduction. 
For many people, God is some kind of vague power who exists somewhere in outer space and who somehow created the world, but who is not interested in the people who live on this planet. Nothing could be farther from the truth. In studying these lessons, you will see how really interested God is in you and how much he loves you. The instructions which you will receive from the priest will make you more aware of God's love for you. You will also realize how much you have missed in life, and later on you will thank God for bringing you to take the instructions. This is indeed a demonstration of his great love for you. Now those words of introduction were addressed by Father Kogan to the converts who were going to read this book and uh, follow the course of instruction that he provided with the help of many other priests advising him. These brief instructions, uh, 43 chapters, followed by some prayers and, and other uh, uh, bit of practical advice given to those entering the Catholic faith, uh, are very much to the point. Uh, some might say, actually, they're, they're so brief <clears throat> that uh, that's all they give, is just the point. But that's a good start. And that is why the priest is encouraged to uh, comment on these questions and answers, to kind of fill them out and uh, put them in the proper context and give them a wider and a deeper understanding of these points of Catholic teaching. teaching. Uh, now, as I, as I mentioned, um, I'm going to be approaching these as a catechist, and I ask you please to forgive me if it's uh, very conversational, not polished in any way, uh, because I won't have a great deal of time to prepare a, a written text. This is going to be an off-the-cuff, as it were, commentary on these questions and answers chapter by chapter. So again, I ask your indulgence. If uh, not as fluent, glib, or uh, even perhaps um, complete as I should be, it might happen that I'll come back and, and revise or correct some of the instruction some of the commentary I give here, and you can help with that too. As Father Kogan asked the priests who used what was originally mimeograph pages to give instruction, uh, I ask you to uh, write in and give suggestions of what might be helpful too in going through this catechism as a course of instruction for those who are interested in uh, renewing their Catholic faith or in embracing the Catholic faith for the first time. Now, lesson one of this text uh, is simply entitled Religion. And the first question is, is, what is the purpose of these lessons? And Father Kogan gives this answer to fill in what is missing in the lives of so many people, the knowledge and practice of true religion. And there he quotes from the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter 15. The heart of the wise seeketh instruction, and the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. Now, this uh, answer uh, that uh, religion, that these lessons in the Catholic faith are to fill in what is missing in the lives of people, well, yes, that can be true, especially for those who are already uh, in their own minds and hearts uh, thinking of themselves as Christians. Uh, there is definitely something missing in their faith and their knowledge of our Lord. Uh, if they have not come to the fullness of Christian Christianity, that is the teaching of our Lord in the Catholic faith. Uh, the knowledge and the practice of the true religion is essential. Uh, why is that? Well, simply because uh, it tells us exactly who we are. We cannot know who we are unless we know that we are creatures and that we have a creator. And uh, to know who that Creator is, is the most important thing that we can find out. Because we are created in His own image and likeness, and for His purpose. To know who we are, and to know what our purpose is in life, the very purpose of our existence, we have to know our Creator, and what His mind was, and what His intent was in creating us. Now, the very word religare, uh, that is the etymological the foundation of the word religion. Religare means to bind or tie again, or tie back to. 
And religion actually reunites us or uh, ties us back to God. It reconnects us, as it were, to God. And uh, that is the purpose of religion, to uh, unite us in uh, knowledge and in love for our Creator. When Father Kogan goes on to the second question, then, it's with that in mind. Why is religion the most important study you can take up? And his answer here is because God expects you to know what he has taught and what he wants you to do in this life. And here, uh, Father Kogan quotes 1 Corinthians, the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 3. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become as... Let him become a fool, that he may be wise, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And here St. Paul is merely pointing out that this world uh, despises the wisdom of God. When I say this world, I mean this fallen world. It uh, glories in its own conceit and its own pride, and therefore when God speaks of humility, as the foundation of our own spiritual lives, tries to tell us that we are creatures who have an obligation of obedience and love to a Creator. The world says no. When God says, Thou shalt or Thou shalt not, the world says, Absolutely not. I will not. I will not serve. That is the voice of Satan, and it is the voice that he has communicated to the rebellious soul here on earth. So, that is why religion is so important, because religion uh, denies the denial. Religion uh, turns the soul to God in faith and hope and love, and enables the soul to live. Uh, the, the world here, which is fallen, wants to bury us in its uh, appearances of giving us the purpose of life, that is, simply to live for the things of the earth and to perish with them. But uh, religion tells us that we are created for much more than that. That we have a God who knows us and loves us, who created us to know and to love him. And so when uh, Father Kogan gives the answer that religion is the most important study of all the things we can study, because God expects us to know what he's taught, this presupposes that God created us uh, and wants us to know him, uh, that God created us out of love and wants us to love him. So it is the fact, the very idea that we can have a bond with God, a, a, a spiritual bond of knowing and loving that is the very foundation of all real religion. And that is why this study is so important because, well, let's face it, I mean, if, if we talk about human beings as having the power to know what is true, and having the power to love what is good. Well then, the, the greater truth we can know, the highest truth we know, uh, is the highest act of knowledge we can have. It raises us to the highest level we can have of our humanity. And what is the highest truth that we can know, but truth itself in Almighty God? It is that that enables us to be the very best we can possibly be. If that is the truth we know, that is the act of knowing, truth and in its very foundation in Almighty God, that is the most perfect act of knowing a human being is capable of. And if we are created to love, and our wills have that power to love, then of course the most perfect and the best object of our love elevates us to the highest level. And uh, enables us to be our very best in loving what is the best. And in, in God, there we find the highest good, infinite goodness. And so it is in knowing and loving God that we are the very best we can possibly be uh, using these highest powers that a human being has, of knowing and loving. And it is in, in doing that in knowing and loving the supreme truth and the supreme good, that we find the ultimate beauty, perfect beauty, all the beauty that we see on earth, all the beautiful things we enjoy here, are nothing but 
the, the, the barest reflections of the beauty that we find in God. Well, I just actually defined what prayer is. It is in prayer and knowing and loving God, the very act of knowing and loving God, and in enjoying the beauty that is in God, that we are the very best possible human beings we can be. It is for that we were created. That's what religion gives us. And so it is the most important thing we can study. Now here, uh, Father Cogan goes on and asks, well, what is religion? And he answers, religion consists of two parts. One, believing everything God has told the human race. And two, observing all your duties to God, yourself, and your fellow men. And he quotes there the epistle of St. James, chapter 1, verse 22. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now notice, uh, Father Kogan answers the question, what is religion, with two parts. The first part being, believing everything God has told the human race. Well, this again presupposes something that Father Kogan hasn't mentioned yet, and that is that God has revealed himself. God has spoken to us. God, creating us to know him, must then make himself known. And uh, he has, in fact, done so. And so all religion starts with God making himself known to us uh, by what we know as revelation. Um, but the second part of that, then, is what we might call religion proper, uh, reserving all your duties to God, yourself, and your fellow men. Now, in that sense, we might say that religion is putting into practice your faith. It's actually putting into practice your belief. Now, there are many who claim to believe things today, but they don't practice them, right? There's an old saying about practice what you preach. If you don't practice what you preach, you're a hypocrite. You demand others to practice what you believe, and you're preaching it to them, but you yourself don't practice it. The primary example of that from the scriptures and from all history are the Pharisees. But uh, to be pharisaical and to be hypocritical, of course, is totally contrary to true religion. Because true religion is simply a living out, and putting into practice, and being true to what you believe. It's not just a matter of having faith, it's a matter of being faithful. And uh, there are those today who claim that they're spiritual, but they're not religious. And I suppose that's a form of protest, because they have rejected what they call organized religion in favor of uh, evidently disorganized religion of their own making. Uh, but the fact is that uh, uh, religion is simply a matter of being true to what you believe uh, and being faithful to it, putting it into practice. And uh, that is actually what is required of a Christian in following Christ is to not only believe in him, but to uh, love him enough to be faithful to him, to obey him. As our Lord says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so religion is simply that. The Christian religion is following Christ uh, in thought and word and action. And uh, question number four of this first chapter, is religion really necessary, is answered as follows. Yes, for several reasons. One, God demands that every human being follow his plan of life. Two, without religion, life is meaningless. Three, lack of religion causes unhappiness, both in this life and in the next. And here, Father Kogan quotes from the Old Testament Book of Wisdom, chapter 3. For he that rejecteth wisdom and discipline is unhappy, and their hope is vain, and their labor is without fruit and their works unprofitable. Their wives are foolish, and their children wicked. Well, that pretty well sums it up. Uh, the result of a lack of faith and a lack of hope in God, and how fruitless all of that, uh, that life is. So he says that religion really is necessary, uh, just as faith is necessary, and uh, practicing faith is necessary. Uh, the first part, he says, God demands that every human being follow his plan of life. It's simply a matter of fact that God creates human beings for, his, for a purpose. 
um, his purpose. And that purpose, he wants him to be happy and blessed and share in his own divine life, as we find out through the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, God has a right to demand that we fulfill the purpose for which he gave us our existence, for which he gave us life and for whom he gave his own life on the cross. He has a right to demand that we be faithful to that. Um, Father Kogan mentions here that life is meaningless without religion. And uh, I think what, he's, uh, what he means here, he's talking about the Christian religion. Uh, he's talking about the fact that there is no hope, uh, that only Christ can give us hope. Um, even all the other religions of the world really do not present any genuine hope. Um, they give a, a false hope or a hopelessness. But Christ our Lord has taught that not only uh, are we created for life, but we are created for everlasting life in him. And he is the only one who's ever promised that. Uh, no one else ever could or ever has made a promise like this, that he can give them everlasting life, even a share in the divine life of our own Creator. And uh, the, the third point Father Kogan makes is that their lack of religion causes unhappiness. Certainly in this life, again, hopelessness is, ruins every life. Um, and uh, in the next, well, yes, it, it leads to, uh, as we know, eternal damnation. When there, we do not follow Christ, there is no other Redeemer, there is no other Savior, there is no other source of hope. Only He can give us faith, true faith, and only He can give us hope. And only He can really give us the love of God. Now, when we talk about hope, and the, the, we tie religion together with hope, you know, we, we go back to, again to human nature as God created it. What is hope worth? Or I perhaps would better say, what is human life worth without hope? I mean, we see people every day uh, actually ending their lives in despair because they have no hope. They feel they have nothing to live for. Um, they've given up in any, any hope of... Uh, of having hope, even, or having something to live for. And it's so tragic. Um, when one loses hope and falls into the depths of despair, he falls into an own his own personal private hell and tries to escape it by ending this life and the hopelessness that he's basically imposed upon himself. But in doing so, he finds true hell. And that having rejected the real, very real hope he has in our Lord, that he has found genuine hopelessness in hell. What a tragedy that is for those who, uh, by their own hand, end their lives here. Uh, because they've lost hope. And you know what they've lost hope in? They've lost hope in the world because they placed their hope in the world and it has failed them. If they place their hopes in the things of the world and they find out they've been deceived and the world has betrayed them, uh, a failed romance, uh, a ruined bank account, whatever it might be, causes them to lose their, their hope and lose their lives because now they have nothing to live for because that's all they did live for. What a tragedy. And that's what religion saves us from. It saves us from thinking that we're created merely for the things of the world. Uh, and it saves us from the hopelessness that comes if we lose the things of the world and realize that uh, for our Lord's sake, we would gladly lose the things of the world for the sake of having Him and having everlasting life, which only He can give. So the next question here in, number, in chapter 1 is, what will happen to those who do not practice religion? Those who do not have true faith and those who do not practice it uh, will be punished forever in the fires of hell. 
The answer Father Kogan gives is they will be punished with the everlasting torments of hell. Uh, God gives the grace to all to begin. By his actual grace, he gives, he, he offers the grace of faith, the virtue of faith to every single soul. That's a mystery to us because we can't enter into that action of God and witness God giving that, offering that grace of faith to every single soul. But he does. And every single soul receives that actual grace to make that act of faith. And those who reject that, um, that initial grace, set themselves on a path on a path to hell. Well, even beyond that, I mean, we realize we come into the world flawed by original sin. And so we need that act of faith to open up the door then to an act of hope and then an act of charity, to receive these virtues of faith, hope, and charity into the soul, which are necessary for the salvation of every soul. Read St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 13, and he spells it out in 13 brief, beautiful verses right there. And so those who do not have true faith and uh, follow it and live according to it will go to hell. Souls will be, as we say, lost. All we have to do is listen to the words of our Lord to his apostles, those who believe and are baptized shall be saved, and those who refuse belief will be condemned. There are those in the world today who don't want to hear this. They absolutely reject this idea, but their argument is not with you, their argument is not with me, their argument is with our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, they will lose that argument. And number six, what will religion give you in this life? Father Kogan answers, peace of mind, which is greater than anything money can buy. Well, there you are. And I, again, I tie this back to hope. Uh, the, the virtue of hope is, is the thing that we human beings need. It's, it's the, the air we breathe. It's more important to the soul than the air that we breathe is to the body. That, that is uh, the hope that faith gives us, the faith in Christ. And uh, here, Father Kogan actually quotes... Uh, from the New Testament and the Old Testament. He quotes here, St. Luke, chapter 11, verse 28, Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. And he quotes from the Old Testament, Psalm 118, Much peace have they that love thy law, and to them there is no stumbling block. And uh, Father Kogan ends this uh, section, this chapter 1, by asking, Are all religions the same? And he answers, No, there is only one true religion, the one established by God himself, which is explained in this book. And uh, we'll develop the answer to this uh, question a bit more as time goes on. But I would just point out that this, uh, this, this answer is is just fundamental reason here that all religions cannot be the same because if they were all the same there would be only one religion. The fact is we have multiple religions because they contradict each other. Why? Where did these religions come from? They were made up by mankind. They're made up by people. Um, made up by modernists, you might say. Um, they, we have these religious leaders who have dreamt up their own religious systems and people have gathered around them and have uh, formed whole worldwide religions around them in the course of time. Often these religions become the basis for a social system and they form their own societies. Um, we see uh, in civilizations past how they were all built around religious beliefs of one kind or another. And when worshipping false gods, St. Paul says they were actually worshipping demons. Whether they recognized them or not as demons, they still were devils. And that is why they often worshipped these demons by sins. I mean, what did peoples of the past offer their demon gods? 
They offered them murders. They offered them human sacrifice, murders, murders of those uh, captured in war, uh, captives. They offered them virgins to be thrown into volcanoes. They offered them babies to be burned to death in the arms of the stern uh, god Moloch, the, 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 the uh, bronze uh, demon god whom the pagans worshipped in the Old Testament. This is what they offered. What did they offer their demon gods? They offered them their sins of fornication. They offered them their sins of adultery. Uh, they offered them every vice they could come up with. This was the sacrifice they made to their demon gods. These were sacrifices worthy of demons. Uh, and so all religions cannot be the same, obviously. Some are true and some are false. And generally the religions invented by mankind are religions that actually worship demons. Now, uh, are there some religions that have been natural religions that have actually extolled certain natural virtues? Well, yes, actually there were. Uh, in certain societies, their natural religions uh, still found some basis in humanity, um, in, in the human conscience, to honor courage, honesty, uh, to honor temperance, the basic moral virtues, they weren't necessarily motivated by a love, well, certainly not for the true God. Uh, they were motivated by a certain sense of perhaps self-respect or even pride. A person thinking that he was superior to others because of his temperance, while others were despised as drunkards. Uh, a certain... Uh, human pride and self-esteem, as they call it these days, for being brave, whereas others were cowards. It's possible to have natural virtues, even the natural virtues of prudence and justice and fortitude and temperance. But unless these are motivated by a love for the true God, they're only natural virtues, and even these cannot save one's soul without faith and hope and charity. But there were some natural religions that did uh, value and promote these natural virtues. Unfortunately, of course, because these religions were tainted um, with pride and, and self-serving and human passions, they often even masked the, the wickedness of these passions and these sins under the guise of these natural virtues. It was only our Lord who could really raise them out of the muck, who could really raise the human soul out of the muck that it had fallen into, face first, lying face down in the muck of the earth. Only God could raise us up from that. So there can only be one true religion. I mean, one could argue that there is no true religion, that there, you know, that all religions are false and all religions are simply man-made, and all religions are simply trying to deify ourselves and project our human nature into some imaginary heaven, an imaginary creator. There have been those who have claimed this. I mean, Karl Marx, for example, uh, claimed that this is religion is the alienation of ourselves from ourselves, and so on and so forth, all this, all this uh, verbiage. Of nonsense that you come up with, but the fact is that uh, even the human reason left to itself can come to a truth unmistakably, can, can reason to a fact from which there is absolutely no escape, and that is that there is a God, that we have a Creator, and uh, that that Creator uh, created us precisely to know Him and to love him. And so, if we are willing to acknowledge that fact, we must say that that God has made himself known. So, there can only be one true religion, but there certainly is one true religion, because God has revealed himself to us. And uh, not only is there, in fact, a true religion that God has made known to us, but he's made it knowable. And even, even using mere natural reason, 
one can come to that conclusion. Actually, the First Vatican Council made that a dogma of faith, that mere unaided natural human reason can come to that understanding and a knowledge of God's existence, certain of his attributes, and the fact that he's made himself known and revealed himself to us. Not only is he, is he uh, knowable, but the fact is that uh, God wants himself to be known by us. And he wants us not only to know him, but to know his love for us and to respond by loving him in return.